to 1 Samuel chapter 25, verses 39 through 44, for today's reading of God's Word. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verses 39 through 44, this is God's Word. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has avenged the insult I received at the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from wrongdoing. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. When the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they said to her, David has sent us to you to take you to him as his wife. And she rose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, Behold, your handmaid is a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hurried and rose and mounted a donkey, and her five young women attended her. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and both of them became his wives. Saul had given Michal, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was of Galen. Amen. This is the fourth message on chapter 25, so I'm just going to focus on the last part that we just read. It was love at first sight between David and Abigail. But what could they do? She was already married to Nabal, and David too had a wife, even though he was forcefully separated from her. To their credit, they managed to suppress the romantic stirrings of their hearts and went their separate ways, yet unable to stop wondering about what might have been. But things changed quickly against all their expectations. Within a matter of 11 days, Nabal was dead, and Abigail was free. He proposed to her, and she was only too happy to oblige. This is the kind of stuff that Hollywood romantic comedies are made of. It is hard not to feel happy for David and Abigail. How can we not? Why are there so many romantic comedies made? They are all about two lovers overcoming all kinds of misunderstandings and mishaps and obstacles to finally come together. It is so gratifying to see their love for each other come true in the end after so much trouble. We know how painful it is to have a secret crush on someone and have no hope that it will ever work out. There's something cathartic about seeing two people finding someone special in each other and having one's love appreciated and reciprocated by the other. If our culture seems to be obsessed with love, think about all the movies and songs and poems made about love, the romantic love. It is because we know the importance of love in our lives. So if we feel this way about David and Abigail, so happy that they got together, I need to tell you that we may have bitten too much of the world, which tells us that as long as two people love each other, everything goes. I'd like us to see how dangerous, dangerous it is to make love the most important thing, and what was wrong with what David did in today's passage. We will also see why God seems to be treating David differently from Saul and how that relates to Christ and us. Let us remember that as beautiful and precious love is, or because it is so beautiful and precious, love can be easily distorted into something ugly and dangerous, such as lust. How does lust differ from love? Lust is different from love in its self-centered orientation. Whereas love is for the good of the other, lust is for the satisfaction of one's own desires for pleasure and possession. 
Lust is different from love in its inordinate desire. Love is intense, but not out of control. We know that it is no longer love but lust when we are consumed by it and we lose all sense of balance. It becomes something harmful and destructive. And lust is different from love in its illegit illegitimate object. Lust has as its object something forbidden. Even when it desires the right object, its desire is too much. And lust is different from love in its need for immediate physical gratification. Lust cannot wait, but love is patient. You can see how dangerous it is even for love to go unchecked. How many and how badly people were hurt and even abused in the name of love. Think of tiger, helicopter, bulldozer parents. Think of all the Romeos and Juliets throughout history whose unchecked love drove them to tragic ends. Think of all the crimes of passion committed, even murders in the name of love. As good as it may be, love cannot be allowed to run rampant and turn into lust. And let's not forget how easily love can turn into jealousy and obsession too. So the question is, how do we reign in love so it doesn't turn into lust? It must be contained within the confines of God's law. God's law, of course, is not opposed to love. It is all about love. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Ten Commandments are applications of these two greatest commandments. How to love God and how to love our neighbors. But this shows that just because our acts and words are motivated by love doesn't mean that they are proper expressions of love. We can love others sincerely and wrongly at the same time. The law of God keeps our love from turning into destructive lust, jealousy, or obsession. So then, before we celebrate David and Abigail's union as a triumph of love, we must ask whether it was right according to God's law. When the Lord struck down Nabal, it might have seemed like an act of God's providence to bring David and Abigail together. But what did we learn from the preceding chapter? David chose to do the right thing, in the eyes of God, by not putting out his hand against Saul, God's anointed, even when God delivered him into his hand. You see, the ultimate standard of our action is God's word, not God's providence. We do not walk through every open door of God's providence. By opening different doors, God tests us to see whether we are committed to obeying God's law, not what seems expedient or comfortable or convenient or commonsensical or even providential. I'm not saying that every open door we should not go in and we should not, and, and we should not take the opportunity. All I'm saying is that we must make sure that the door of providence must be along the path of God's law for his glory. Every, we have to make sure that the door of providence that God opens for us must be along the path of God's law for his glory. Of course, containing love from turning into lust is easier said than done. We know how strong love's desire is to be made complete by meeting its match. And few, thing, few things leave our hearts cold, bitter, and even vengeful more than 
unfulfilled and rejected love? How do we deal with the frustration and anger of love unrequited? We grant that love is important, maybe more important than anything else in this life. But God must come before love. You don't have to be afraid because God is love. But we have to remember that love is not God. God is love, but love is not God. We can experience true love only when God is supreme. When our idea of love supplants the supremacy of God, it degenerates into lust or something destructive like unbridled jealousy and obsession. The good news is that God does not call us just to simply bear the crosses of unrequited love. He offers us the greatest love of all. He has given us the gift of himself, who is love. Human love is subject to change and decay, just like everything else in this world. Human love changes because we change. Our tastes, our preferences, and our perspectives all change over time. And so do the people and things we love. When we were young, we would fall in love, believing with all of our hearts, at least at that moment, that we could not live without him or her, and without him or her, our lives would be utterly meaningless and joyless and unlivable, which was only an infatuation. Yet, we fell out of love as quickly as someone more attractive came along. But on the nobler side, our love may grow deeper with each passing year. But our capacity to show our love by providing for them, protecting them, and doing acts of kindness to them decreases as we get older and grow more dependent on them to our great sadness. But God's love does not change because he neither changes nor grows old. You may not find his love exciting like the initial stage of dating someone you have a crush on. Remember? God's love may not seem exciting, but you have to realize, and I hope you recognize, that God's love is more abundant and constant than the air you breathe the water that fills the ocean, and the ground you are walking on. His love is there with you when your loved ones depart one by one and you feel all alone. His love upholds you with his mighty hands when life and people disappoint you. His love protects you under the shadow of his wings when others attack you with unfounded criticism and slander. His love warms your heart with his abiding presence when you are left cold and alone because everybody has abandoned you for your failures and mistakes. His love encourages you to keep on keeping on even when nobody recognizes your hard work. But if you have the eyes to see, you will also see that his love is far more exciting than anything else in this life, more life-giving than the monsoon rain pouring down on the drought-ridden wilderness, more explosive than volcanic eruptions to change your life, more earth-shattering than an earthquake in transforming your life, more exciting than hump whales breaching right next to you when you're on a ship, to your marvel and delight. This is not because God's love changes from boring to exciting. It is because his love is multifaceted to meet all our needs, to give the sunshine of his joy to the gloomy heart when we are gloomy, to give us the refreshing rain when we feel despondent, the manna of strength when we feel weary in life's journey, The North Star, when we feel lost. The wind of encouragement to the sails 
of those adrift on the ocean of life. To the heartbroken, he gives his comfort in abundance, but to the obstinate, he applies his tough love. He knows what is best for us and gives it to us as needed. Some may see nothing wrong with David's union with Abigail. Do we not read at the end of today's passage that Saul gave away Michal, David's wife, to another man? If so, doesn't that justify David's union with Abigail? Maybe when Abigail and David came together, she was widowed and he was divorced. But consider how the story is told. We hear about what happened to Michal only after David took Abigail and Ahinoam as his wives. If anything, it sounds like Saul gave Michal away to another man after hearing the news about David's new wives. How dare you treat the princess of this nation like that by taking on another wives. Of course, Hebrew narratives can be arranged thematically, not in chronological sequence, so it could have been that Michal was given away before David and Abigail came together. But even if that were true, it would not change anything. David did not just take Abigail as his wife, he also took Ahinoam as his wife too. He turned his marriage into a polygamous arrangement in which he had many wives. So much for a great love story between David and Abigail. But if what David did was wrong, where are God's rebuke and condemnation of his action? When Saul disobeyed God's commands and sinned, Samuel was right there to bring God's condemnation. Yes, Samuel was dead by this time, but there were other prophets that God could have sent to David to bring God's rebuke. But why should God do that? God had already spoken on this matter. Even before Israel entered, the, Israel entered the promised land, God had already predicted that Israel would reject him and ask for a human king. While he granted their request, he gave stern warnings to the future kings of Israel in Deuteronomy 17. And one of the things he said was, And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Deuteronomy 17, 17. And this command was merely reiterating what God had already spoken at the time of creation. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, Genesis 2.24. And God spoke indirectly through the insolent boasting of Lamech, the first polygamist, not to mention all the trouble Abraham and Jacob had to go through with their wives, and not to mention David and Solomon with their many wives and their many children. You see, God needs to speak only once. He does not need to nag us and remind us again and again what is sin and what its terrible consequences are. If what David did was wrong, why then did God not take away his kingship as he did with Saul? We understand that God did not rebuke him right away, right there and then, but why did he not take away his kingship? This was not the first time he sinned. Why was he allowed to keep his kingship even after the Bathsheba and Uriah incident? Many of us think that those sins were far worse than what Saul did. There are two things to consider. First, both instances of Saul's disobedience were against God's specific commands, which came through Samuel. Saul's specific disobedience to these specific commands required God's specific response of rebuke. David's action of taking two additional wives was not a violation of God's specific command to him. This is not to say that it was not sinful. I'm just pointing out the possible reasons for God's different responses. 
And second, we start by admitting what is obvious. God treated Saul and David differently. Saul sinned and God took away his kingship from him. David sinned too. Most will view his sins of adultery and murder as more grievous than Saul's sins. Yet, God did not take away David's kingship. Isn't this unfair? One reason is that the two kings represented different things. Saul represented the old covenant and David the new covenant. That could mean a lot of different things, but I'm particularly speaking of how the two are characterized in Jeremiah 31, 31, and 32. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke. The breakdown of a covenant results in the removal of the Holy Spirit. God removed the Holy Spirit from Saul. This was in line with an earlier incident in which God allowed the Ark of the Covenant to be captured by the Philistines. When the news reached the ears of Phinehas' wife, she named the boy she just gave birth to Ichabod, which meant the glory has departed from Israel. And according to Ezekiel's vision, the glory of the Lord departed from the temple, chapter 10, verse 19. This was what signified the official end of the old covenant, the departure of the Holy Spirit from the temple. Think about it. At the time that the old covenant was established, Mount Sinai was covered by the glory cloud, a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And soon after, the tabernacle was built and the glory cloud moved from Mount Sinai to the tabernacle. And when Solomon built the temple and dedicated to the Lord, the glory cloud filled it again. Do you see how the glory of the Lord is so intimately connected even with the old covenant? Because that was the essence of God's covenant with his people, for him to dwell among his people. The glory cloud, which was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, represented God's presence among them. You see, it was not that the old covenant was all about the law and no spirit. Just that the problem with the old covenant was that because Israel broke the covenant through her repeated rebellion against the Lord, the glory of the Lord had to depart eventually. And this was why David feared, the, th th this is why what David feared the most when he sinned against the Lord by his adultery and murder was the Lord taking away the Holy Spirit as he did from Saul. Psalm 51, 11, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Amazingly, the Lord did not. But how could he not? The sins that disqualified Saul from kingship seemed mild compared to the sins David committed. But we need to change our perspective here. I want you to know that I'm not trying to downgrade the gravity and heinousness of David's sins. In fact, I want you to not lose sight of it in the background. We may not think much of David's sin, uh, Saul's sins, until we say it was directly related to the sacred things of God. He did not wait till Samuel came and he offered sacrifices himself. And he did not devote the Amalekites to destruction as the Lord commanded him. According to Leviticus 27, 28, and 29, the things and or people God devoted to destruction were holy to the Lord. That is, they were set apart unto God for destruction like the sacrificial animals. And therefore, these things could not be ransomed. These things could not be spared. Saul's sins were grievous because they profaned the sacred things that belonged to God. 
Every sin is defiance of God's honor and rebellion against God's authority. Even the sins we commit against other people because it is God who commanded us to love our neighbors as ourselves and not to do any harm to them in the second table of the Ten Commandments, the fifth through the tenth commandments. But when we sin against others, we may sin indirectly against God. But when we break the commandments in the first table, the first through the fourth commandments, we sin against God directly. Which sin do you think is more evil? The one we sin directly or indirectly against God? Isn't it fascinating that David said in Psalm 51, 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Remember, Psalm 51 was written as David's penitentiary psalm about his adultery and murder. How could he say, after doing all that stuff, that he sinned only against God? He was not downgrading the gravity of his sin against Bathsheba and Uriah. On the contrary, he was counting on us to have that in our minds when we read these words. He was trying to show how much worse our direct sin against God is than the most hideous sin we commit against others. Because so much greater is God's honor than any man's or woman's honor we violate. Could it be that taking our worship lightly is no small sin. Could it be that taking the means of grace, like reading God's scriptures and the Lord's Supper and the sacraments and praying, neglecting these things are no small sins. Maybe far worse than what the world thinks are terrible sins. But what happened with David? He was not without sin. To this passage is one instance. We all know what David did with Bathsheba and her husband Uriah later. And having seen what happened to Saul for his sin, what was David most afraid of? As we said, that the Lord might take his Holy Spirit from him as he did with Saul. And amazingly, God heard this prayer and did not remove his spirit from him. Was it because his prayer was sincere enough? No, it was only because he was chosen to represent the new covenant, which is different from the old covenant because it is unbreakable. The new covenant is unbreakable because it is established by the blood of Jesus Christ, by which he brought our complete forgiveness once and for all. Therefore, the Holy Spirit will never be removed from his people. David took two wives in today's passage. He would take more, including Bathsheba, in a far worse way. David's son Solomon would take even more wives against God's law. But David's and Solomon's greater son, Jesus Christ, did not take any wife. This was not because there was anything wrong with marriage. God established it himself at creation. But Jesus did not come to establish an earthly kingdom whose kings took on more many wives and mistresses simply because they could. The number of the wives that they had was a symbol of their prowess, something to boast of. Like Lamech, they poo-pooed God's creational design for human marriage and gloried in their shame. No, unlike these kings, Jesus came to establish a different kind of kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, and, and, and in that kingdom, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage but we'll be like angels in heaven, Matthew 22, 30. And how do you become a citizen of that kingdom? 
Under the old covenant, it was through natural birth and circumcision. Under the new covenant, it is through supernatural birth, being born again, being born of the Spirit, which is spiritual baptism. And that was why Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit as the head of a new race of people fit for a heavenly kingdom. And this was why Jesus never married and had children. His love was not romantic and sexual in nature, but spiritual and religious in the best sense of the most biblical sense. His object, was, his object of love was not one woman, but all the people of God in the spiritual and religious love. The people of God who are his bride, the church. His goal in life was not his personal happiness in a marriage with a woman, but the salvation of all his people in a spiritual union. David did not have to do anything to have Abigail as his wife. In God's providence, her husband died only 11 days after her encounter with David, and he took her. But Jesus had to do what Hosea was called to do. The people whom he had chosen for his bride were prostituting themselves with Satan under the bondage of sin. He had to pay the ransom for their sin. Because the penalty of sin includes all miseries in this life, death itself, and the pains of hell forever, under God's wrath and curse, he had to suffer all miseries in this life, sacrifice his life, and endure the eternal pains of hell all at once on the cross on our behalf. You have heard, you have heard this before. How are you responding to what Jesus did for you as your bridegroom? Spurgeon says, how is it that if we read the story of a common man suffering by his own folly, we freely weep? And over the silly story of a lovesick maid, we will feel our pity stirred? But here on Calvary, where the king of heaven is tortured with unutterable woe, tormented with sorrows so tremendous that they overtop all the griefs, as a mountain exceeds the mole hills, we are like flints or steel and scarcely feel compassion move. I was pierced by these words. How many times I shed my tears watching romantic movies, touching stories, And yet, when we read about Christ's love for us, we are hardly moved. But to think that Jesus did this for us. On the cross of Jesus Christ, we find the greatest love story ever told that no Hollywood romantic comedy can ever match with their tens of thousands of productions. And to think that you are part of that love story. His dying love is for you, the eternal Son of God dying for us while we were sinners. And having rescued you with his life as your ransom, he rose again from the dead and works in you to sanctify you so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Brothers and sisters, is he not worthy of your love? He has loved you to the point of giving his life and shedding his blood to the very last drop. 
He loves you with all of his heart and soul and mind and strength. How can you not love him with all your heart and soul and mind and strength? You may not have everything you want in life. I realize that. I know that. I see that in my life. Maybe you can see so many things that are lacking in your life, but you have Christ. You have Christ who loves you, who has loved you to the point of dying. He who's got the whole world in his hands loves you. He who is the fountain of life, he who is the fount of every blessing loves you with all of his being. Is that not enough? Does he not deserve your confidence even when you happen to go through the valley of the shadow of death? Does he not deserve your thanksgiving even when you find yourself amid trials and scarcities? Brothers and sisters, I want to challenge you. Because it's unconscionable for us to love like this. What can you do to show your love? What sacrifice of time and money and energy can you make to show him that he is your Lord? What bad habits and sinful patterns, what conveniences, what worldly opinions and aspirations, what standards of comfort and lifestyle can you give up to show him that you love him above all things? Do you know this, but you find it too difficult for you to do? Don't give up. He has given us the Holy Spirit who abides in us and works without ceasing to make us Christ's beautiful and glorious bride. Pay attention to him as he speaks to you through God's word and your conscience and follow his lead every day. Brothers and sisters, let us practice loving him as we meditate on, as we experience his love every day in thousands and thousands of different ways. Let us practice loving him back for that will be our greatest and chief joy in heaven when he shall come to bring us to our heavenly home so that he might love us eternally and we might love him back eternally. Let us pray. O Lord our God, how we give you thanks and praise for your marvelous grace to us in your son Jesus Christ. We thank you for the greatest love story to which you have invited us. Thank you, Lord, that we are the recipients of the greatest love. And our story, our story in Jesus Christ is the greatest love story ever told, ever experienced by anyone. So, Lord, Help us to cast out all spirits of discontentment, bitterness and anger and jealousy. Help us, Lord, to learn the secret of contentment in Jesus Christ. No matter what happens, no matter how hard life gets, help us, Lord, to kneel before your presence and say, thank you, Lord, I have you. And what do I lack when Christ is mine and I have his eternal and unending love? And I pray, Lord, that we will be encouraged and we will encourage one another to hold on to this great love. And all the difficulties and temptations will lose their power as we abide in Christ. As we learn to love him with the love that he has given to us.
Bless us as we continue to our celebration in the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.